So what I've heard is that people are getting a little bit of case fatigue. So um, maybe we'll just pause for a minute. And uh, if, do people have questions that they want specifically answered? Uh, aside, you know, this isn't a mini clinic. We can't do individual consultations. But if you have some general questions that you'd like answered that we haven't touched on, um, by all means, ask. Use the microphone. We have heard about disease of the body in several forms, except the heart, heart stroke, stroke and et cetera. Can cancer grow in the heart or some, it has to be contributed from another organ to the heart? Or can it grow, develop in the heart? Can cancer develop in the heart? Is that your question? Yes, sir. Yeah, there are primary tumors of the heart. They're extremely rare. Um, it wouldn't be related to kidney cancer. It would be, you know, probably a sarcoma because the heart is made of muscle. But um, tumors can occur primarily in the heart. But as I say, they're very, very, very rare. So the most common tumors found in the heart are metastasis to the heart. And uh, the, uh, the uh, commonest one would be lung going to the heart, lung cancer. Uh, melanoma, which is a rare, I mean, rarer than lung cancer and breast cancer, uh, can, uh, has high propensity to metastasize to the heart, melanoma. Kidney cancer, rarely. We've seen a few patients develop uh, metastasis to the sac uh, and sometimes in the uh, heart muscle uh, occasionally, but it's rare. It's one of the rarest sites. Uh, it's more common to go, as we discussed throughout the day, to lungs, lymph nodes, bone, liver, and brain, but m much, much uh, less uh, frequently to go into the heart. Any other questions? When you just mentioned something about the brain, how often does kidney cancer adv advance to the brain? Because that hasn't been mentioned on any of the case presentations. And there hasn't been a lot of stuff listed as far as uh, liver disease, you know, advanced liver disease to the, you know, metastases. So you're, you're the question we, is about... The question uh, is, uh, do you have some case presentations where you have some uh, better metastases, shall we say, with more advancement, like to the brain? What are you going to do? What do you advise the patient to do? Sure. Uh, I don't think we have uh, any of the cases uh, brain, but I think we certainly can uh, you know, answer or discuss any particular situation. Uh, uh, you know, if there is one uh, with a brain metastasis. Uh, well, I know when we uh, get in support groups and everything, and the there is metastases from renal cancer to the brain. Would you please go to the microphone? So this one's not working? Oh, I have to talk closer? I don't like these things. Okay. Okay, what I'm asking is, you know, when you go online to the uh, kidney cancer support groups, when you, you go to the other support groups and people there have uh, metastases to the brain, uh, very little is ever talked about. And of all of the presentations that you've had here, you know, we're not addressing some of the rarer things. And I'm sure some of the things that we all worry about is, uh, you know, you hear the term scanxiety. Everybody loves to go for the CAT scans because what's the doctor going to tell me, you know? And so how do I know if it, when it's affecting my brain? What's going to happen to me? Which of these medications are going to work for me? Can you answer that? Sure. These are good questions. I think the brain is, a, uh, is not an uncommon site for, for it to go to the brain. The, as we were just saying earlier, uh, it is not a very common uh, site. Uh, so lungs, lymph nodes, adrenal glands, bone, liver. In this uh, ranking order, brain will be the least uh, it goes to. Uh, but uh, you're, you're right. There are uh, uh, complications or there are challenges when it goes to the brain. But I think uh, the brain... Uh, should not be looked at as it's you know a death sentence because it is not. There are patients who who, who develop metastasis to the brain, who are treated. I mean, obviously, it depends on whether we're dealing with one spot, two, three spots, or 10, 15, 20 spots. Um, I think obviously, if there is uh, that many, you know, uh, usually typically more than five, 
the recommendation would be to, depending on the size and the location, to treat with, with radiation or surgery. If one is particularly large, uh, causing uh, symptoms, headache or dizziness, or and it looks like on MRI or CAT scans causing bleeding, is to resect it. And then the smaller ones being treated with gamma knife or stereotactic radiosurgery. Sometimes if there are many, they're all small, um, or in, there in particular uh, locations where uh, surgery would not be possible, then we do whole brain radiation if there are multiple. But systemic therapy, uh, uh, again, this is uh, contrary to what uh, some people think, that the medicine doesn't get to the brain. On the contrary, uh, some of the medicines we use to treat the, the, the metastasis in the lungs, liver, bone, etc., does uh, cross the blood-brain barrier. And we reported on patients, a series from MD Anderson, uh, seven patients that had disease in the brain where we treated with uh, suited and uh, they, some of these patients responded. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, two of them responded completely without surgery, without radiation to the brain. But it has to be an individual case-by-case uh, -case discussion. Uh, I'm not su suggesting that every patient that has spread of the cancer to the brain to uh, not get radiation or surgery Obviously, you have to discuss this. You know, this is a uh, consultation that we have with the neurosurgeon, with the radiation doctor, and the medical oncologist. Uh, but it is not a death sentence. There are patients who are alive, uh, doing well, even though they had uh, uh, metastasis to the brain. There are some patients who don't have metastasis to the brain, have metastasis just in the lungs or just tumor in the kidney, but it's unresectable and continues to grow and invade surrounding structures such as surrounding organs where the prognosis is worse than the, if the patient had their kidney removed and now they have one or two or three spots in the brain. I have many patients who have brain metastasis who are alive and well for two, three, four, and five years and beyond. So it's not a death sentence. There are treatment options and it's an integration of local therapies with surgery in some patients where surgery helps radiation with gamma knife or whole brain radiation as well as systemic therapy with drugs. Now, in terms of how do you know, the only way to find out is doing an MRI uh, of the brain. Now, the problem is recently has been insurance companies are pushing back. They're denying. Every time we put an MRI of the brain request, they say denied. Why are you ordering an MRI? Then we tell them whether the patient has cancer of the kidney and it's spread already to, say, lungs or other organs. Uh, we need to make sure it's not spread to the brain. We don't want to wait until the patient has seizures or uh, uh, is falling, uh, ataxic, to uh, then f get the MRI of the brain. And sometimes when we talk peer-to-peer -peer with the insurance companies and try to, to convince them, they see it and they say, okay, you can, you can do the MRI of the brain. Uh, but, you know, uh, unfortunately, sometimes uh, this is found or discovered when the patient develops a symptom or, or a sign. You know, they may either have some abnormality, you know, difficulty speaking or double vision or weakness in the arm or leg or numbness and then you are, get the MRI of the brain and you find there is tumor there. But whenever we find this in the brain, we treat it in consultation with the neurosurgeon and the radiation therapist and uh, the medical oncologist. Does one of you, she also asked about liver metastases. I wonder if either you or one of the other medical oncologists wants to talk about that and why we maybe haven't really covered that very much. Roberto, you wanna, uh, or Michael, you wanna, uh, well, there is the notion that a, li a liver metastasis um, uh, carries a prognosis, um, and probably that's true. Um, there are, you know, some um, papers on IL-2, and the patient that who have liver metastasis may respond less. Um, but, but on the other hand, I have a patient who has only liver metastasis, and maybe solid liver metastasis, and they're still doing okay on treatment. So I think the organ specificity tell us uh, uh, some about the biology of this cancer, but um, one thing we didn't discuss much about the tumor heterogeneity today, what does it mean? That even though we're talking about kidney cancer, but there have been some very elegant studies now suggesting, showing that, you know, we're dealing with several type of cancer within the kidney cancer. 
and, and maybe the disease goes to the liver is different from the disease that goes to the lungs, but not necessarily all the time. Unfortunately, we still do not have uh, the barcode uh, to um, characterize this tumor, when is the kidney, when is the uh, bones, so when is the lymph nodes. But go back on the, uh, the issue about brain metastasis. You know, I, I totally agree with you, Nizari, about uh, how we approach that. But it, 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 I think what the, what the message I want to tell you, and, uh, and as I was saying, is that our patient with, kin with the disease in the, in the brain, they do much better than they used to be. And what is because uh, we have a better gamma knife, a more experienced uh, radio neurosurgeons, uh, or this therapy do help, but you know, even I agree, in my practice, I have several patients with instead of brain metastasis, still alive years after. So I think, uh, um, and it probably kidney cancer is, is more favorable disease than other type of cancer. We didn't touch much about the radiation. Uh, we don't have a radiation oncologist here. Uh, but um, there is some compelling role in, for radiation even to treat uh, uh, localized uh, kidney tumors. Uh, and probably the notion that uh, kidney cancer is radio resistance, um, probably that's not totally true. I would like to ask a question here. Here at MD Anderson, do you use SIR spheres to treat the uh, liver cancers? I know at uh, Stanford they do, uh, because liver is liver when it comes to SIR spheres. Do you use SIR spheres treatment here? Uh, I think we have a surgeon. Uh, it's it's uh, an interradial uh, radiologist, that, uh, the interventional radiologist that do it, because the medication comes from Australia. Yeah. So, no, we're not using that, but we're using uh, nanoparticles. The one of you're the, using uh, the therospheres. No, they're using uh, you know different uh, chemicals, uh, gold okay. and others, uh, with nanoparticles in the liver. One of the surgeons who does this is Dr. Stephen Curley, uh, but uh, that's okay. a, he's a, a surgeon. So I think maybe what she liver means, surgeon. and no, I'm certainly not an expert on hepatocellular carcinoma or colorectal cancer, but there are, there's chemoembolization that they're doing through interventional radiology, and I think maybe that's what you're that talking, what about. talking about. That's what I'm talking about, is the chemoembolization. It's uh, not, the as far as I know, it's not used for kidney cancer that's metastasized. Well, it's not FDA approved, but it is for colon cancer and breast cancer, uh, and I just wondered if they, if they've attempted to do it here for kidney cancer for tumors, uh, massive tumors in the liver. Yeah, so um, I guess my, my response to that uh, is that even though in general the, it's, it's a cancer that's in the liver, it still retains the characteristics of kidney cancer, which right. is notoriously resistant to, chemo, to standard regimens of chemotherapy. So uh, I, I might be best being quiet now because I'm going outside my realm and letting my colleagues in medical oncology pick up pick that up. But the, the biology of the colorectal cancers that go to the liver and the liver cancers is much different than a kidney cancer that goes. So unfortunately, um, you know, because that therapy might work for that patient population, it, it, it does not translate to the same for kidney. Uh, I have two questions, a little bit more general. One, if you could bring us up to date on if there is any progress on immunotherapy. He's smiling. <laughs> and the second is the most recent Time Magazine uh, front page uh, article dealt with how we're going about our cancer research and focused specifically on trying to tear down the silos between institutions certainly between re different researchers, et cetera, and get everybody sort of on one big macro team. We've got three institutions here, so I thought maybe you could um, speak a little bit to uh, how, if anything's changed in terms of collaborating and, and seeing that as a mechanism to propel us a little bit faster and perhaps further um, to finding some answers. Thanks for your two good questions. Uh, Dr. Harrison, you want to uh, address the first one on uh, new, some of the new immunotherapeutic approaches to treating kidney cancer? Sure, yeah. I mean, I think 
It's an interesting question because there are some new immunotherapeutic approaches in kidney cancer. Um, certainly the one that's gained the most press is targeting the, the PD-1 ligand or you know, kind of anti-PD-1 or anti-PD-L1 antibodies. So, so let me kind of explain what that is. So, um, so high dose interleukin-2 is something that kind of revs up the immune system, we think, to try to attack the cancer. Um, and, and so this is a little bit more specific. Um, it, it's known that there are certain features of kidney cancer that make the immune system it kind of immune to the immune system. And so um, with these inhibitors, we can kind of release that or, uh, or block these checkpoints and maybe target the, the kidney tumors better. I don't know if that's making a lot of sense because it's kind of an inhibition of an inhibition. Um, but at any rate, there, there are some interesting drugs now in phase three studies. Um, there's one compound by BMS, there are others. Um, so there's a study, um, for example, in patients who've had one line of treatment already with metastatic disease, and it's randomizing them to either everolimus, which is a finitor, or this new checkpoint inhibitor, and, and seeing if that will benefit patients and what's been really interesting is, is that in the earlier studies, so, so phase two studies in smaller numbers of patients, um, we've seen some benefits where patients seem to have similar kinds of, of stable disease or kind of uh, remission type features. And so that's, that's been very interesting. Now there are other, there are other interesting immunotherapy approaches. Um, there's an autolog autologous vaccine approach that I know Dr. Wood is, is involved with. This is the so-called ADAPT study. This is taking uh, patients who present with metastatic kidney cancer and who need their kidney tumor taken out. And what it's doing is it's creating a kind of a personalized vaccine from the patient's own kidney tumor um, and giving that to the patient. We probably be on this to talk about all the specifics of that right now, but um, either giving that with sunitinib in the first line or giving sunitinib alone and, and seeing if that has a benefit. There, there are some other immunotherapy options, but I think to me those are kind of the most, most compelling ones, the checkpoint inhibitors, anti-PD-L1 or PD-1, and then the, uh, the ADAPT study of the autologous vaccine. Roberto may have some others um, Sorry, just, uh, that he's interested the point. in. These are not FDA approved yet. These are investigational, investigational uh, therapies and you can only get them by participating in a clinical trial, uh, depending on your uh, situation. So uh, some of these trials, uh, you know, the one that uh, Dr. Harrison just mentioned is for patients who had two or uh, one prior therapy, and they should not have received prior mTOR inhibitors such as Toricel or Affinitor. And they get randomized, meaning, you know, randomly allocated to receive the experimental therapy, this new immune checkpoint drug, anti-PD-1, versus the mTOR inhibitor, Everolimus. But there are some phase one trials, meaning early stage of development, where they are looking at giving also the anti-PD-1 in combination with other agents uh, for patients who had multiple prior therapies. So you have to check and see, go online, or contact uh, your oncologist if the, your oncologist can find out for you whether you are eligible to participate in some of these trials. We have these trials available for uh, patients who are interested. Uh, the other important question is about collaboration. I think this is a very important question. Uh, the, uh, every institution is uh, you know, different. Obviously, I'll, I'll let Dr. Pile speak about what collaborations uh, their institution, uh, which is Roswell Park in Buffalo, New York, they're doing. But at MD Anderson, we are collaborating with uh, other institutions uh, to, and we're going to submit a SPORE grant application to the National Cancer Institute. And um, in collaboration with uh, University of North Carolina and Charlotte and Stanford uh, and Baylor, we are uh, putting together a grant to uh, study uh, different uh, aspects of kidney cancer. This is mostly research, but that is translational, meaning you know, we hope that uh, whatever discovery or basic science in the lab, in the laboratory, uh, we, we uh, find, we bring it uh, to a clinical trial to patients. And so that's that uh, mechanism, that uh, collaborative mechanism is called SPORE, Specialized Program of Research Excellence. So it's a multi-million dollar uh, grant. It's competitive. So not every uh, institution or 
collaboration of multiple institutions will get it because you're competing not only against other uh, grant applications about kidney cancer, but also about other types of cancer. But that's one way of institutions coming together and trying to advance science, advance research, to try to find better therapies for the patients and hopefully cure. So, uh, uh, Roberto, you want to speak about uh, uh, y your institution and what uh, collaborative efforts you, you have or initiatives? Well, first of all, I want to commend you for the question and the comments because I think it's very, uh, you know, speaks uh, about your knowledge and your your um, interest in this. Um, and I think you touched a, a very important uh, uh, point. There is no way that we're going to advance uh, research or help a for patient with kidney cancer unless we, we work together. And, uh, you know, it's not always easy to get together and to work together. And I think uh, the support mechanism that, that uh, Tamir has mentioned is one. We don't have many of these grants available right now for kidney cancer. Uh, like in other disease, like breast, uh, prostate, uh, colon, ovarian cancer, as a matter of fact. There's only one right now uh, in the country. So we need more of this uh, uh, um, team of institutions work together. And, and hopefully we're going to have more in the future. You know, depending also the financial support that, as you know, NIH has uh, trouble to, to get. But one thing I would like to mention is what uh, I think um, we're missing uh, potential is a network of institutions to run clinical trials. So to have a kidney cancer clinical trial consortium. Um, and I think at KCI, the Kidney Cancer Association, and, and uh, it would be a perfect organization to help uh, the community of scientists actually to get things that together. You know, there is a, a, a similar effort in other diseases like in pa pancreatic cancer, uh, prostate cancer, where patient advocate groups have really been pivotal to get the funding to get this uh, network. Because, you know, there are some institutions, some investigators have a clever idea, but they don't have the means to run this, this clinical trial. So I think they have an infrastructure that, of course, costs a lot of money. But uh, I think if there is a resources out there and the right people to get to, to make it happen, to me, um, you know, this poor application, these grants, absolutely we need those, but we need to also have an infrastructure to translate this in the clinic. Um, and, and again, that's something that, as, as say, if this comes from the patients and their family, um, it, will, it will help us to, to make it happen. Chris? Yeah, I just make one other point. I think actually one of the greatest collaborations that is ongoing that holds the most promise for um, kidney cancer specifically, but cancer in general, is the, um, it's called the TGCA, it stands for the uh, Cancer Genome Atlas. And basically what this involved were numerous institutions throughout the country sending in specimens to the NCI. Uh, we actually, I think, contributed something like 70 kidney cancer specimens. Uh, and at the NCI, these um, specimens are being you know, basically studied six ways from Sunday. Uh, you know, back in the old days when the, for the Human Genome Project, when they were trying to sequence the human genome, it took them, you know, years and years and years and hundreds of millions of dollars. Now we can sequence a genome in an afternoon and for a thousand bucks. So the technology has really tremendously improved and actually there is a database online that any of us, even you, could go to and study. Uh, and if there was a gene of interest that you thought might be involved in kidney cancer, you could evaluate, you know, 500 patients who, who, whose tumors have been evaluated to see if it is and then develop a drug for it. So, you know, the, there is increased collaboration. There are still challenges with intellectual property and those sorts of issues, but, um, you know, ventures such as the TCGA, I think, hold promise for really curing cancer in our lifetime. Any other questions from the audience? We have one from our um, Twitter followers who are watching online um, that it's um, the, the sibling of a patient who was treated with high dose IL-2 and had a partial response and now is on Votriant and was curious on your thoughts with that therapy. Um, so the, this is a patient who had high dose interleukin-2 
and uh, presumably either didn't respond uh, or did, was intolerant to therapy. Oh, he, the patient had a partial response and then had progressive disease, and now the patient is receiving uh, Votriant. I think that's uh, an acceptable therapy. There are other uh, alternatives, but I think this is an acceptable therapy um, uh, outside the context of a clinical trial. Now, if, you know, or when the patient uh, stops responding to this agent, uh, the patient would be a candidate for this anti-PD-1 Dr. Harrison talked about, so that there is that trial. It's in phase three, uh, and it's looking at patients who had prior immunotherapy with, say, interleukin-2 and received uh, uh, target therapy with agents such as Votriant or Sutent and the like. And uh, they can, uh, in the future, can in the future uh, participate in that trial with anti-PD-1 uh, versus uh, Everolimus. But that's an appropriate therapy. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Do a couple more trials. All right. Okay.